everybody. Uh, my name is Fran Burwell. I'm one of the vice presidents here at the council. And I want to thank you all and congratulate you for staying through the lunch break. We've had uh, an excellent, I think, discussion so far today, both on and off the record. This session is on the record. And uh, I think we will return to a lot of the themes of the day. Um, you'll see there's still one missing panelist, and he is on his way from a meeting over uh, near the White House. So uh, he will, Elmer Brock will be joining us very sh shortly. Um, we've heard a lot today about the importance of a transatlantic strategy towards Europe's east. Many speakers, going back to our first two, Steve Hadley and, and Radek Sikorsky, have been eloquent about the why, as was Foreign Minister uh, Rinkevich. Uh, the panel is about, this panel is about the how. It's clearly part of the how is about defense and military capabilities, and so NATO will play a key role here. Um, but as an earlier speaker said, it is key to make the rest of Ukraine and the rest of Europe's east a success, uh, economically, politically, et cetera. So in 2009, the EU launched a major effort to bring relations with the countries to the east to a new level. The aim of the Eastern Partnership was to accelerate the political association and further economic integration between the EU and interested partner countries. And I would point out this is not just about developing them separately, but about bringing them closer to the EU and along the EU model. It was based on the idea that this was in the interests of both the EU and those countries. And this was a significant and comprehensive approach addressing governance and political reform, economic reform and growth, including deep and comprehensive free trade agreements, uh, energy diversification com and competitiveness, as well as, was mentioned earlier, people-to-people -people contacts such as the Erasmus Plus program. Um, but as we head towards the Riga summit, it's clear that this effort now faces a very, very difficult environment. We've talked today about how at one time Russia was on a more positive path, but that has now changed. And in fact, Russia has made the Eastern Partnership process, I would say, a target itself. Um, we have seen that the technical Eastern Partnership has become, in a way, a very strategic program. And it is, I would say, at risk right now. Um, so what we're going to talk about in this panel is first a bit on what are the lessons of the Eastern Partnership and the experience since 2009, particularly as we find ourselves in such difficulties in Ukraine. But more importantly, given this new environment, how do we go forward? What should we expect at the Riga Summit? What will it take to make the Riga Summit a success? The, German, the Georgian Foreign Minister described Riga as an opportunity to demonstrate that the Eastern Partnership can deliver and I think we should hold the summit to that high standard. Um, we've also talked a lot today about, in earlier panels, about how the US can engage with this process. So my other big question for the panel is going to be, what should be the US role? Perhaps not so much at Riga itself, obviously that's an EU meeting, but how do we go forward with Europe in figuring out what is next for the Eastern Partnership. Uh, we have a great panel to talk about this. First up is going to be Ambassador Stefan Fula, former European Commissioner for Enlargement and European Neighborhood Policy. From 2010 to 2014, he essentially was the Eastern Partnership person, uh, managing this and leading it during a key period. He's also served as his country's ambassador to Lithuania, Ukraine, uh, sorry, not Ukraine, UK, and NATO. <coughs> We then have Ana Palacio, former foreign minister of Spain and very active in European politics and I would say one of the most astute commentators on European politics that I know. Um, and then Dr. Horori Nemiria, uh, who is chair of the Human Rights Committee in the RADA and a former vice prime minister of his country and former foreign policy advisor uh, to Prime Minister Timoshenko. Um, and we will be joined by Elmar Brock, who is chair of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee and who has been very active, particularly in the, uh, is he just coming in? Particularly in the lead up uh, to the Vilnius, uh, to the Vilnius summit in terms of uh, trying to convince that, the then Ukrainian government to sign the association accord. 
But let me start with Ambassador Fulla. You ran the Eastern Partnership for some time and through a very difficult summit in Vilnius. Uh, what lessons have you drawn about this experience? And what do you think will make Riga a success? Many thanks. Uh, uh, um, before I start, uh, well, let me address one misperception. Eastern Partnership as a technical process. It, uh, it ignores one thing. In 2011, uh, together with Kathy Ashton, uh, we have looked at our neighborhood policy uh, and we have Lisbonized uh, about the foreign policy of the European Union. Uh, we have not talked about that uh, uh, until now, but that is quite a profound change on what we can uh, have achieve uh, using all those instruments Commission and the member states have uh, in their power. We uh, already at that time, 2011, took lessons from Arab Spring, and I'm still one uh, using this, uh, 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 this uh, expression. And we have introduced uh, not only more for more principle, mm -hmm. which was not there originally in the Eastern Partnership, we have also introduced uh, uh, the element of interacting not only with the authorities, but also with the civil society. We have introduced another important element. The stability should not never again be sort of uh, uh, put only on our relations with uh, representatives of uh, the totalitarian regime, those uh, uh, who do not promote democracy but fight democracy. In other words, uh, the stability should be based on the democracy. But we were very clearly saying uh, the road to achieve that is going to be bumpy and might be long. Well, we didn't know, I mean, it would be that long and it would be that bumpy. Yeah? <laughs> but we, actually, we also introduced another element. Our new neighborhood policy in 2011 is the only document in addition to Lisbon Treaty which talks about Article 49. For the first time, we put the wall between the Eastern Partnership and the eventual uh, membership in the European Union. Right? Of course, as a commission, I mean, it's in the hands of the member states, uh, not up to the commission to tell, I mean, who's going to join the uh, uh, EU uh, or not. But we, for the first time, 2011, said that the country which sort of delivers on the uh, Eastern Partnership with the European and, and has a European aspiration actually gets closer to then eventual at certain time refer to Article 49 and, and, and join uh, the European uh, Union. Huh? After all, if we're serious about the reforms and transformation in that part of Europe, which is the remaining part of the Europe still to be addressed, then I think we need to be serious about the most powerful transformation mechanism our organization, the European Union, had, and it is enlargement. As clear as that. Lessons. Um, oh, we made a mistake. Uh, Michael is here. Michael? No, he's not. <laughs> He's not here. He was. Um, uh, because he asked in the morning, I mean, what are sort of the lessons, the mistake we made. Uh, but actually, I have identified uh, three. Uh, first, Ukraine. Uh, we focused on benchmarks. Um, uh, but before the Vilnius summit, you remember some of you, uh, 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 but was it really about the Ukrainians' uh, 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 ability to sign the association agreement, or was it about us finding a consensus of member states to sign this agreement? I would say it was about us. Uh, just let me remind you that uh, uh, Yulia Timoshenko was in prison at that time. Uh, Yanukovych, uh, his uh, steps were sort of uh, far from uh, being described as a democratic uh, and uh, pro-reforms. Uh, so uh, the ready the association agreement, which was already there for, on the table for two years, uh, 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 we had an important uh, task to find a consensus among ourselves. What it meant? Well, it meant that we did not have really time on addressing substance and preparing for the implementation uh, of the association agreement. Uh, and if you're interested then in the questions, you could ask me, I mean, what uh, uh, the President Yanukovych told me 10 days before uh, the Vilnius summit, which stumped me as far as huge misperception 
what the association agreement was about or what it was not about. That was the first mistake. The second mistake was we had a consensual and ambitious policy vis-a-vis -vis our Eastern partners. Or we cannot say the same about Russia. Okay? It was not ambitious. It was not consensual. So you had a geographical uh, line in the east of Europe which clearly defined uh, this consensual ambitious policy on one side and the lack of an of a ambitious and consensual policy on the other side. Uh, as in the first case, could that mistake be somehow prevented? Wow, well, uh, hardly at that time. The third mistake, uh, uh, and that's my final remark at this uh, stage, uh, uh, we have not been able to react to the European aspiration of our partners. The mentioning of Article 49 2011 was first steps from the Commission. I would still claim brave step. But then uh, I thought uh, it should be the member state uh, 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 saying that uh, not that Ukraine or Georgia or Moldova would become a member state uh, uh, in 5, 10, 15 years, but to show the light at the end of the tunnel. Because with the association agreement DCFTA, we come out with the most ambitious uh, agreement and, and treaty between the EU and partner countries. Something would really bring the partner much, much close uh, to the uh, European Union. And all the partners were telling us, uh, we will do the reforms, we will implement them, uh, but make it sure that there is a pass after the association agreement. Tell us that at the end uh, we will be able to join the club. Come on, you check. I'm, I'm, I'm check. It was easy for you because you had that perspe perspective from the very beginning. And that allowed you to, at that time, to adopt some of the legislation and do the things you would not do just for your country. But you did it because you knew that at the end there is a membership. And I expect that from Riga, if we fell in Riga, delivering on this one, um, um, uh, it, will be, it will be a huge mistake. Well, let me follow that up with Ana Palacio. Ana, you're from Spain, uh, a country far from Ukraine. And uh, a lot is made about divides in Europe, north, south, uh, and who is, there's this, this idea that some countries are more supportive of the southern neighborhood and some are more supportive of the eastern neighborhood. Do you see that divide? Do you see the Eastern neighborhood as something that still must be a priority? And also, particularly on this question of the membership aspirations, uh, <clears throat> Stefan Fulla has said it was the most important foreign policy tool that the EU had. And there were some implications this morning that by not granting it, uh, it has made it, those countries more vulnerable. So do you think that there is a consensus to move towards Riga and, and change anything that we're hearing about the membership perspective? Do you, what do you think will happen? And how important is that? Well, well, thank you. And really, thank you for a fantastic event. Uh, well, first, allow me a couple of comments on this idea of joining the European Union being the most important. No, it is the tool, mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. the tool. You, you, you really, you cannot ask countries to engage in very difficult reforms, and especially in a country like Ukraine that had to combat the corruption, for instance. I, I have the experience, and this is one of these things that I, I, mean, I don't have to prove my Atlantis scholars, but if I had, as I, I was just invited by the National Democratic Institute to co-chair the, the delegation mission to the elections in Ukraine with Madeleine Albright. And this allowed me to just crisscross the country and speak with people. And what people would tell me is, you know what, we need Europe because without European Union, we won't be able to tackle corruption. Mm -hmm. Corruption is our main issue, and we need you, because without belonging, we won't be able to address this. And this is something that it was not just one person from all levels. This was so. I think that we, in the European Union, we have to have a clear analysis, and we don't. 
And this is not a criticism to the European Commission, because the European Commission cannot go beyond the powers that the, that the treaty gives the European Commission. So many times we just, I mean, lambast the European Commission. The European Commission is too bureaucratic, it's too technocratic, it lacks strategy. You know what? It cannot just go beyond what, what they can do. But the truth of the matter is that <clears throat> we have had scattered policies because the commission responsible for the enlargement was not in charge of, the, of some of the big budgetary yeah. lines, for instance. So we, we, we have a lot of, of limitations. We, we cannot ask what we cannot deliver to the, to the European uh, Commission. And frankly, if we go back to Romano Prodi when he said, well, we give everything except institutions. Thank you very much. What are you giving? I mean, honestly, it's just joining, abiding, having to change. And I come from a country that joined the, the, the union. And we, we, we had not to just perform the reforms that a country like Ukraine has to perform. But yet, it was very difficult to, to comply with the acquis communautaire. You know, it's not an easy task. We need to have a good analysis of where we stand, what we can deliver, and what are our instruments. And the first thing is that we have the transformational power, the trans not the most important, no, the transformational power of the European Union is the perspective of joining the European Union. So uh, you ask me in the south, in the north, me, Fran, let's be clear about this. It's not the south of the north, except Poland, the Baltics, uh, Finland, the, the, the Nordics, and I would say that Denmark much less than Sweden, and uh, just uh, to different extents. I mean, don't ask me about uh, Hungary, for instance. So it's not just the southern mm -hmm. that are looking to the Mediterranean. No, it's pervasive. And frankly, in Germany, and here we have uh, Elmar Brock in Germany, and this is what makes the, the position of Angela Merkel, of Chancellor Merkel, very courageous, is that both the public opinion and the business community are not at all for sanctions. There is a sympathy towards, towards Russia, and frankly, the, business, the, the German business community bet on the modernization of Russia as the next uh, uh, I mean, the next uh, big uh, increase in, yes, of, yeah. of their GDP. So it's not the South. But yes, of course, having said all this, in the South, Ukraine is very far away. If I may tell you an anecdote, when I was in government, we were discussing the neighborhood policy enlargement to, uh, to Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. And I was very vocal on this. And everybody came to ask me, everybody, me and colleagues from other foreign affairs ministers from other countries, hey, what do you have with, with uh, this, this region? Are you have you lived there? Do you have a novio there or what? Because nobody <laughs> could understand that a Spanish foreign affairs minister has to be projected to the Mediterranean. It's just this is this, these are the preconceived ideas. So uh, yes, it's far away. It's less well understood. And principally, these are countries that do not have had hard experiences with Russia. When I say with Russia, I mean with Russia, not just during the Soviet Union, but with imperial Russia. <laughs> because another, another issue that I think that we have to be very clear is that this is not going back to the Cold War era. It's going back to the ambitions, to the, uh, to the ambitions of the, uh, the empire of the Russian, the old Russian, Russian Empire. So it's difficult. There are divides, and we need leadership. Chancellor Merkel has, has been a, I would say, a, sometimes I would, I would have appreciated uh, more decisiveness, so sooner, decisions mm -hmm. taken sooner. Sometimes it has taken a long time, but she has been there. And I, I think that this is where then the, the commission, we have a new commission, a new organization of the commission. I hope that certain key, um, main, key uh, mistakes, frankly, but key mistakes that are not, uh, crit this is not a criticism to commissioner X or commissioner Y, it was to the, it is to the structure. Uh, I think that we will try to, 
to overcome them, but frankly, uh, we know what happened at the, at the Foreign Affairs Minister's Council and how Greece created havoc. In the end, there was, as always, we muddled through. <laughs> but, but, you know, this is not what we need. We need assertiveness. And if you ask me, Ana Palacio, yes, we need to, to give a clear integration perspective to these countries in the East. And for that, we need leadership, because right now, nobody is saying this. There is no voice. You read everything, and the first thing is that, oh, there is an enlargement fatigue. OK, there is an enlargement fatigue, and nobody says that we are going to include Ukraine into the Union, or Georgia, or uh, into the Union tomorrow. But I think that we need to, uh, all this wordings where we are masters in just having these very convoluted wordings where each and every one can read a different thing that, that just it's suitable. We cannot just say that you will get closer to Article 49. Come on, what does this mean? I mean you, you can, you need, we need to have clear, and I think that what is at stake is not more and not less than the liberal rule of law order today, as so, uh, Anna, Radek Sikorsky said this morning. Anna, yeah. if I can follow up very briefly on a, on a particular specific point, uh, Commission President Juncker mm -hmm. has said that there will be no enlargement for five years. Do you think that that was a useful thing to say, or is it the truth, or is it just something that you... That's the reaction to, a, to, a, to what the perception of what public opinion wants and to the results of the, Europe, of, the, of the elections. But we haven't worked and tried to change. We need a narrative. We need to explain to the European citizens why it makes sense to just to give this uh, European enlargement perspective. And I say perspective, not that, I mean, I, I don't say, no, 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 yes, no. What I don't say is that the process will be finished before five years. It was short. It was true to say, uh, because there will be no member states joining uh, but in that five years. But it was wrong statements, wrong signal, because he changed the rules of the games. Because until that time, the rule of the game was that we judge our candidate based on its own merit. While President Juncker has introduced the political calendar into that. And that's, that, that's you know, bad message to Balkan, Western Balkan countries. Yeah, because the enlargement fatigue, uh, reform fatigue is much worse than enlargement fatigue. Let me bring in Omar Brock. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I would like to take Namiria also. You want, well, all right then, uh, Dr. Demiria. Uh, um, you have been, as, as someone who comes from Donetsk, obviously the current crisis strikes in a very personal way. And the, what has happened uh, in terms of the Eastern Partnership also, I hope, has a very, the prospects, the lessons in a personal way. So what do you see as a, someone who has worked in government in a country that is, shall we say, the object of the Eastern Partnership or one of the partners, what do you see as the lessons and what do you think, shall we say, Eastern Partnership 2.0 should be doing? Yeah, thank you and thank you for reminding um, that's I'm from Donetsk. Uh, it's a surreal what is happening there. Because uh, spending half of my life there, I would never imagine that the things like that could happen. The Donetsk airport uh, has a name of Sergei Prokofiev. He was born in a village called Sunny Village, Sonsevo, in the region now in the territory controlled by the terrorists. The most, uh, the heaviest shelling felt on the town called Shastya, which is direct translation, happiness in English. And we have 900,000 internally displaced persons in Ukraine now, 900,000, even more. So then Anna prompted me to quote Romana Prodi again, <laughs> when he said, in addition to everything but institution, he said the goal of the uh, European neighborhood policy, that was the original, was to create a ring of friends. 
So instead of mm -hmm. ring of friends, we have ring of fire. It doesn't mean that we have to blame the European neighborhood or Eastern partnership, not at all. But it's a point of caution or bell, alarm bell, that if the inertia will be allowed with the Eastern partnership, that we are running the risk to have a, more of the same, which is some balance, not good. So the lessons learned and the expectations and what we expect from the Riga summit. So two things, basically. Clarity of strategy and strong commitment based on deliverables. The clarity of strategy has to do with uh, what some colleagues already mentioned, stopping the, the game that the door is neither closed nor open. Mm -hmm. The other quote of the other predecessor of Stefan, other commissioner. I think this is important to repeat what has been said. You have, if you meet criteria, criteria, you will have European perspective. And in the future, you will become member of the European Union. But it's majorly your task that you have to deliver. The second thing, the strong commitment based on the deliverables has a very concrete expression. If Ukraine and Georgia would deliver on the visa liberalization action plan mm. that it should be granted the visa free travel for in a way that it, Moldova has received. And it would be unthinkable, mm -hmm. believe me, in the environment that Ukraine currently is, that under the pretext of some other reasons, if Ukraine will deliver, that that would not materialize. This is a minimum, I would say, that would be reasonable to expect from the Riga summit. Lessons learned from the Eastern Partnership Edition 1. The important thing that uh, one of the principles was uh, an East principle of differentiation. Yeah. But what is more important now, the self-differentiation phenomena that has happened and is happening now. What I mean by self-differentiation. Those six countries, since the inception phase of the Eastern Partnership, they went through the very different, sometimes common, but different, their own experience. And some of them, like Ukraine on Euromaidan, when people went to protest against the decision of the president not to sign the agreement, Ukraine gained deep inside their sense of direction. And this is a very important part. The same goes for Georgia and uh, Moldovans. So this self-differentiation that has been gained through the hard experience needs to be reflected in the future modernized Eastern partnership. The, next, the second point, the sex, second lesson, Structured conditionality is important. But structured conditionality, if it's not coupled, it is not coupled with a deep attention, strong attention to the system of the governance mm. of the particular country, could be not sufficient to deliver sustainable result. We have an example when, uh, in the case of Armenia, country make a U-turn because that was the decision of the political leaders or leader. In the case, of, and the society didn't, didn't revolt, accepted basically this. In Ukraine, it was close to that when political leader or leaders also, if not making a U-turn, but put the European integration on pause, but that society revolted. So I think it is important when we are talking especially about the implementation of the association agreement, and this is the name of the game under the Eastern Partnership, to make sure that the system of governance, the checks and balances, the transparency of decision making should receive an utmost uh, priority. Because without that, I think we are running the risk to repeat more of the same. And now the third lesson that we should be aware of, this is the attention to the 
very dynamic environment in which Eastern Partnership will go after Riga. And unfortunately, this environment is not a positive one. No. If you, if that's anything indicative of this environment could be, I could give an, uh, just one example. Uh, on Wednesday, in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, it was an important vote on the resolution on the uh, Russian credentials of uh, uh, delegation. And it was a particular amendment on the suspension of the voting rights of the Russian uh, delegation. And it was supported overwhelmingly, but uh, there are four delegations who are voted against. Those four delegations were in full, all members of these delegations, were uh, two countries from the Eastern Partnership. It was Armenia and Azerbaijan. It was Serbia, the candidate country, and it was Cyprus, mm. EU member states. And Turkey, nine out of 10 delegates also voted against. It shows us, at least, that the lowest common denominator, as far as the EU is concerned, probably could become even lower. And with the priority given to preserving the unity of 28, so that would not good sign for the leadership especially when hard decisions are expected. The second conclusion that as far as the even candidate countries, but if you look on the region, it concerns Balkans. So probably, and there are already some analysis that if Putin is really launching the real hybrid war, so he could launch a second front, and it would be an immediate underbelly of, mm -hmm. of the European Union, the so-called Balkans. And then it clearly gives uh, a hard choice to make by uh, Ukraine and by Georgia and by Moldova. So my conclusion that we are going to live through a very difficult period of time, but we probably better equipped to deal with because we don't have any illusions that we had in 2004 or even in 2014 most recently because we are currently in this state when the, uh, what is at stake, the survival of Ukraine as a state, and its survival will be better preserved if country has a clear European perspective. Thank you. Um, I will now do want to bring in Elmar Brock as chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, um, but also a leading German EPP politician. Um, Mr. Brock, um, we've talked a lot, the first three have talked a lot about membership perspective and, and how that is something that has really been a key tool of the EU in moving the Eastern Partnership forward. But it's clearly not, um, the idea of giving membership perspectives in Riga is clearly something that is not uh, with widespread consensus across Europe. And I wonder if you would say whether Germany would be likely to support that and under what conditions, or do you see some countries in the Eastern Partnership as potential members, but not all, and how that would, uh, Dr. Nemeria has pointed to self-differentiation rather than differentiation by the EU. But I think also the question for you is, Dr. Nemeria made this point about the lowest common denominator of Europe becoming lower because of some of the connections of some of the other countries. Germany has been a leader in Europe on this issue. And how will the chancellor help to keep that lowest common denominator from sinking really low? I cannot accept the content of the question. OK. First. Secondly, the title is The Way Forward for the Eastern Partnership. What I heard until now is history books and how to blame the European Union. As I became a member of the European Parliament, we were nine member states. Now we are 28. Mm -hmm. And to have to build a political entity, we have built an, an, an internal market, a common and foreign security policy, where we have still anonymity as a problem between 28 member countries. Uh, we have a monetary union in a very difficult time because we came in big problems because the financial crisis came from 
United States to Europe, but we still struggle with. And this has to be seen. And the European Union and its member states have given to our new member states in the East and the neighborhood countries so much money in the last 20 years, 100 times so much as the United States of America, at least. That's the truth. And therefore, I wouldn't like to be blamed in Washington about that we have not done enough. And uh, we have to see that we struggled for that, that we struggled for that, uh, that uh, we got a new treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon, which lasted too long in order to get the constitutional framework that we can deal with more countries. And we got it only after mm -hmm. the enlargement. We should have had it before. And to have, and have still the shortcomings of the treaty, we have to see the integration capacity of the European Union. Should nobody tell me that the European Union in this present stage would be able to deal with five, six, or ten more countries? That is the reality. That's the reality. And I think we have achieved a lot of things. If someone would have told me 20 years ago that the European Union would stand there where we stand now, I would say that it's a vision which is never achievable. And that we have this stable situation in, our, in the new member states, and all that positive development in most of the member states has to do with the European Union and member countries of the Union that was achieved and that we have now a region of 28 countries of stability. Incredible positive development the European Union achieved. And I was very happy that I heard yesterday from Vice President Biden that this includes also the United States position that all these countries must have the same level, the same quality of security as any country. country both within the European Union and NATO. It's an incredible achievement. And I must say, not everything what happened in the eastern neighborhood countries was so successful in the past. You know it, the total failure of the Orange Revolution, mm -hmm. no progress, had something to do with Ukrainian ambitions in the present situation. Then Yanukovych gave up. So you cannot blame the European Union for that, that there were shortcomings. When I see at the moment the difficulties of negotiation to get a pro-European government in Moldova, I was there last week to try to be helpful. Now they get a two-party coalition, a minority coalition, supported by the communists. Membership perspective? And uh, what we have there, we should look into the realities. And uh, therefore, and that was the question uh, before, uh, before Riga, uh, before, Vilnius, before Vilnius, that we have said countries must make certain movements. Yanukovych stopped that. The question of political reform, of judicial reform, which is a condition for us if you want to give a European perspective. The European Union is not just a free trade area. It's a political entity with common values where you need the democracy and the rule of law. And the country does not make these changes in that transformation process. But if you can't offer membership perspective, and I understand the no, argument you're no, making. No, not offer something which even the countries cannot deliver, as we cannot deliver, make hopes for things which might happen in 20 years. Do you know, and then we have to this question, why not in the next five years? Tell me one country which would be able in the stand of negotiations to join within these five years. Not one. And therefore, do the blame that it said no one will do that. No one would be able to finish this negotiation. Make this association and free trade agreement, make it work, go to the next step, and from the next step to the next step in order until you come to the final result. But it means also the development of the integration capacity of the European Union and the reformability in such okay. countries. Not give only the line, everything in, membership perspective. The European Parliament has said a long time ago. Every European country that is in a treaty has a right to ask for, for Article 49 if this country fulfills the thing. Nobody is stopping that. That's the right, but it has to fulfill the conditions. And uh, uh, we have also said in the European Parliament, make it faster, for example, to develop something like a Norwegian oh, status or European economic area to bring things forward. That is 70, 80% of the IKEA community. It was all rejected. I think one of Not the questions. Not by us. 
just I think one of the questions is if there's not a membership perspective on the table, how do you incentivize reforms? But I want to bring Anna in just, here. Just one sentence, Elmer. Hmm? I mean, we have in mind the fifth enlargement, so the big enlargement, the big bank of 10 countries uh, getting into the union into 2004. And this was a process that in many cases was rushed in. But I mean, we have also other other um, in, other precedents. Spain was negotiating for 10 years, and we accepted transition periods of 20 years and more. And so this means that this five years, five years period, this is not an obstacle. I think that for certain m big reforms, Elmar, you have to to be clear. You cannot say the door is not open, the door is not closed. I mean, where is the door? We what? negotiate <laughs> with countries. We negotiate with them, but it technically it's not possible to conclude any of these negotiations. That's let the me, truth. Let me bring in, no, no, let me bring in the person who did hopes. these negotiations for a while, Stefan Fuller. <clears throat> I think the point is that uh, Be realistic. if you look at the Western Balkans, uh, the European perspective uh, were given in Thessaloniki, what, mm -hmm. 11 years ago? Mm -hmm. 11 years ago, to the whole region, we brought Kosovo to the mainstream of enlargement only last year. So it is about the process. It is about that perspective. Okay? It is, you're not given the light at the end of the tunnel when everything is sort of more or less ready and set up. Huh? You give that light at the end of the tunnel for the people to aspire something and, and, to, and to try to reach out. And later on comes, you know, these difficult negotiations. Later on comes the decisions uh, uh, of the member states, including in some countries, uh, referendas. And, I mean, you ask me on Turkey, by the way, can I imagine Turkey uh, joining the European Union? Yes, of course. But it would be different Turkey. I'd be different European Union. And that's the point. Yeah? Elmar is absolutely right. And no one is saying that it is the European Union as I know it. Uh, the Commission, I, as I left three months ago, they would be ready to accept uh, Ukraine. It would be different European Union. But if we don't reform the European uh, uh, Union, if we try sort of to create some kind of uh, closed club and, and pretend that we will not be subject of these uh, Changes around us, wow, we don't. So I want to uh, come back to this question. I also want to come back before we finish to the question of how the US can engage with this. A good what we've question. been talking good about question. so far. <laughs> I'll let what we've been talking about so far is Very basically question. a European process. So Omar, let me challenge you. What would you what, how would you say the US should get engaged with this? And then I'm going to open it to the floor. Thank you. Elmar, briefly. I've always said That's in the right. question of Turkey, that is the best example, we will take Turkey into the European Union and the day if Spain becomes, uh, if Mexico becomes the 51st state of the United <laughs> States. No. Tell the hypocrisy of the debate in this country. You pay nearly no money on that question what we do. You ask us to do more. You ask for more sanctions, but our countries have to pay it. You can ask on sanctions against Russia, but it's paid by countries like Bulgaria, not by taxes, in real terms. And take that into account. You can ask for, uh, for sanctions against Iran. We did it all. But you have no problems with gas supply and oil supply from Iran. But Greece, in a time of crisis, had uh, to get rid of 60% yeah. of oil supply which came from Iran, which was very expensive for that country. So be, be a little bit fair to European countries who, t who pay more for such sanctions, which are right, which are supported, which is a good thing that European Council yesterday renewed that and made a clear commitment to that. But it's much more difficult to tell that to our people because they cost for something. In your country, it do does not cost anything. So, be not so easy in that way what we do, be helpful in that way, and be together in that way. That might be help us to have a common strength. And I take your point about much of what you say, but I think we want some specifics on how we can be helpful, and I'd like yeah, to... I want to provide an example, then, because we, we just started with the, uh, the, the time horizon of three, a little bit more months, mm -hmm. the Riga summit. Yeah. But I think what is important also to bring back attention to the... Must have a little bit fun. To now, what is happening, <laughs> and by the way, Whatever would happen would have an impact, not just Riga, but more. This is here, we have an issue, uh, and this is the issue which has to do 
if the expectation that the lowest normal denominator, common denominator, is going lower, then it would be a challenge to preserve the other important condition for solving the crisis, namely the uh, US and EU working together yeah. and in coordination, which probably may require and will require more leadership from the US side than it is now. And one example which are important now, as far as the uh, little weapon, defensive weapon is concerned, because uh, continue to say that the just diplomatic solution, there is no military solution, true, but uh, at the same time, we, see, we are dealing with conventional war, where the conventional element, namely military element, is important. And I do expect that when this time will come, and time is now, then the EU would respond in a, uh, in a constructive manner for the sake of this coordination and unity between the United States and uh, uh, European Union as far as the uh, uh, conflict uh, in Ukraine is concerned. Thank you. Um, I've seen a number of hands go up, but the gentleman here was first. Thank you very much. At the Second World War, please identify yourself. My name is Asim Olazadeh, member of Parliament of Azerbaijan. After Second World War, United States uh, was backing the Nuremberg process. There were Marshall Plan for the reforms on uh, Western Europe, and since those period, uh, all the European countries never spent more than 10 percent of U.S. military budget. I don't understand how many minutes Europe without the United States can resist to new offensive coming from, because uh, I don't think that Ukraine is capable to resist Russia alone. I, Georgia, Azerbaijan, or Moldova can resist to former Soviet army. And uh, without the United States, is it possible for the European Union to create its own security system? That's why all problems which we had on, uh, let's say, uh, transatlantic cooperation during the last years made Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Moldova victims of uh, such a problems. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pick up the gentleman back there. Great, thank you. Thank you. My name is Valery Kowalewski, Belarus Politics Blog. Uh, I would like to refer to the issue of Belarus. Uh, it's not represented here uh, among panelists, uh, but nevertheless, it has a very special place uh, at this stage of uh, Eastern Partnership. For more than 20 years, Lukashenko has been president of Belarus, and as a result of his policies, uh, the opposition field in Belarus is destroyed. Economy is very weak. Uh, Belarus has become very, very dependent on Russia, very vulnerable to aggressive policies of Russia. Right now, uh, Lukashenko has reached out to the West, uh, trying to normalize relations uh, with the European Union and with the United States. And Eastern Partnership is one of the ways for him to, uh, to implement this task. At the same time, he remains true to his practices. Uh, he suppresses independent media, he keeps in check the opposition and civil society, human rights defenders are expelled from, from Belarus, new political prisoners appear, and existing political prisoners are not released from, uh, from the country, uh, from, from prisons, from behind the bars. At the same time, we have uh, political opposition expelled, uh, some, uh, some disappear, some are expelled from the country, some are uh, some are just forced to leave uh, to leave politics. Yes. So my question is: Is uh, your Eastern Partnership ready to re-engage Belarus without reciprocity in uh, actions of Lukashenko? Is there anything that could be done to make Lukashenko implement and actually change the regime from within without replacing the regime? Entirely. I think Thank we have you. two very interesting questions here for the Riga summit. I mean, to what degree, given the situation, should the Riga summit, whether it's directly because of the Eastern Partnership or on the sidelines, be thinking more about security issues or the types of issues that Dr. Nemiria raised? And the other one is Belarus has been a difficult country for the Eastern Partnership to deal with. Um, and yet one does not want to uh, abandon countries necessarily. So uh, how, do, how does the EU create links but with countries that are being difficult where governments are going in the wrong direction? 
uh, and yet you don't want to simply abandon them. So let me ask uh, Stefan Fuller to go first, and then I'm going to pick up others. Can I have the first question, I mean, uh, address a little bit uh, differently? Uh, one of the challenge for uh, Vilnius sum of our Riga summit is going to be how uh, to deal with those who do not uh, clearly define their European perspective, uh, how to deal with those uh, uh, whom we say that they are free to make their choice and sovereign right to make their own choice, but nevertheless, because of the circumstances, they are being made or even forced to make a different choice. Right? You probably know the country I'm talking <laughs> about, so I'm not going to name it. And this is important. This is important issue. Huh? One of the, uh, uh, the, the person here sort of uh, uh, asked about, uh, okay. let's not create a new dividing lines. In me pursuing the policy, I've always been very clear. <coughs> the Eastern partnership is not about choosing Moscow or Brussels. Right? But, and number one. Number two, I was saying, it was actually not about making them to that choice, but strengthening their sovereignty and their ability to make that choice. I hope very much that we'll be able to do that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the countries with the European perspective. But we need to do that also vis-a-vis -vis the countries uh, who have uh, other concerns. And those who, because of some other consideration, joined or about to join uh, the Eurasian Union, we need to find uh, the relationship between the European Union and Eurasian Union that those countries are not forgotten. Well, why we still pretend the Eurasian uh, Union is only about Russia, only one person, Putin? Because, no, I'm sorry, it's not the truth anymore. And by the way, the, uh, Lukashenko uh, 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 is, is a good sign in that, uh, in that direction. Huh? And Kazakhstan might have its concerns too, huh? after it's being called uh, artificial uh, country again. Huh? Uh, coming back to Belarus, uh, um, uh, uh, re-engage, yes, by, by, by the way, we have re-engaged uh, Belarus already sometimes uh, ago with the dialogue on modernization. Uh, but uh, moving, re engaging is one thing, and moving forward is a different thing. More for more principle uh, applies here quite clearly. Uh, each and every step uh, by him will be accompanied by our step. We will not be making three steps and waiting for him to make one. Uh, but we will do that uh, together. And I hope very much that what's going on in this region will uh, make uh, all of us able to work that together. Let me bring in Elmar Brock on this issue, and particularly Belarus? Look, first of all, we would like to help such countries to keep their independence, which is our utmost importance. I agree with uh, Mr. Fuller that uh, this, all this uh, relationship to the Eastern neighborhood countries is not against Russia, but um, enables such countries to take sovereign decisions. It's all about integrity, integrity, and the sovereign right to make decisions with whom the agreement should be set up. This is Russia does not want. And here we have one question to make the difference, that we say we will do that if such countries move towards democracy and the rule of law. That is a country where we have, with Belarusia, certain problems. We had at the end with Yanukovych certain problems, but it was solvable. There was played other parts the reason who paid more money in Sochi. And uh, that is, uh, questions uh, that uh, Azerbaijan choose not to make an association agreement. Perhaps clever, but also the development in that way of rule of law and democracy is not so very far in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, shows the level of possibilities. But nevertheless, we would like to help these countries in such developments and on a way to do so. And, uh, uh, but it might be in a way, now we are in a fight with Russia again, that we should not look anymore so much in the case of transformation process. But the transformation process, politically and economically, is a condition for a success story. I compare always how Ukraine and the Ukrainians themselves with Poland. 1990, 
Ukraine and uh, Poland had more or less the same GNP. Now Poles, uh, Polish is one five times, nearly five times uh, or four times. And uh, that has to do with this transformation process. That Europe is better, that uh, market economy is better, that the support of the European Union is a good thing in to have structural changes. The European Union gives every year for not so much developed regions and weak persons. Every year, 15 billion euros. Every year, a Marshall Plan. Every year, free of choice, paid by Europe taxpayers, by the taxpayers of the European Union. Two. Two poorer regions and poorer people, <coughs> European Union. No. And social fund, regional fund, uh, uh, countryside, uh, this, uh, rural uh, fund, and so on. And that is incredible progress. And we give also money via s different uh, 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 instruments to countries, like neighborhood countries. The European Union pays from its budget alone three times so much money for peaceful, non-military foreign aid than the United States does. It's a figure. We should take just not that what the, the European Union pays 60% of the foreign aid of this world. Yes. Probably not so, enough. Let me bring in. But not enough. But uh, that, I think, has to be seen that we are do not enough, that are shortcomings, but that we try. Yes. And that, I think, should be taken into consideration and not to say everything is these people in Brussels do not want, are not able, and do not understand. Yes. And this so, and in and in we are in Brussels try to change men, national mentality now in defense. We give fifty percent of member states for defense, fifty percent. But only with ten percent of the results, because we have not the synergy effects and everyone does his own procurement. This we want to change. The European Parliament will make a report in a few days about yeah. it. We hope, hopefully in the summer, a yeah, summit summer about summit, that to yeah. change that, to have more uh, military capacity because of that reason, because there's no money available, so we have to look for the synergy effects. In that question, and that it, we do a so lot. Let me but come to an army question, nations in Pulik and Schengen have possibilities for the army and share it with other countries. It's in a sense of national sovereignty an incredible step forward. Let me return somewhat to uh, some of the questions we have before us. And I want to ask you, uh, Anna, about this question of the EU engaging with the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, is this a way to engage countries like Belarus? Is it worth pursuing? What? And then I'd like to hear, I want to bring in the gentleman here who had a question after that and also hear from Nemerion. But first of all, Today. on the Eurasian Union, it takes two to tango. Yeah. And the Eurasian Union has been created as an alternative to the European Union. So let's not fool ourselves on this one. Second, on Belarus, the two words, the two key words have been mentioned. First is independence, so the, f the, the ability to really have a choice. Second is compatibility. <laughs> These countries have a ties to the region, to Russia, and this, is not, this should not, never be in conflict to uh, just the, this, uh, this, this process of getting closer to the European Union. Sometimes we have given this impression, and this was a wrong thing. Now, two very, very brief comments on the United States. The first is, frankly, I, I agree with Elmar on this idea. Don't ask us what you have to do. You know that. But we can tell you what you should never do, is tell us what we have to do, especially vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Because this is the, the worst thing that you can do. <laughs> well, uh, in the interest of Turkey, uh, just being a member of the European Union, I fully agree with, uh, with what uh, what you have said before. So this is the first thing. The second thing on aid. Uh, Elmar is right about official aid. Mm -hmm. But this is not true if we, t if we take the aid that, that this, uh, this country, so the United States, channels through private and, and NGOs and all this ah, come culture. On. No, no, millions absolutely. compared with billions. No, 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 ah, no, Elmar, on. no, that's not Millions that's compared not, to billions. That's, that's not true. But anyway, uh, let's not, let's well, not discuss. I think that this, the, our Ridiculous. official aid, and last Ridiculous. is that investment, 
is 10 times as effective as official development yeah. aid. And this is, uh, in one of my previous incarnations, I have been senior vice president of the World Bank, so I know what I'm speaking about. Let's not speak about aid. Let's speak about investment. And this, by the way, it's true in these countries we are speaking about. We need to make this, uh, these economies performing so, so that there is uh, foreign, foreign investment Spain. that goes there. So, we should cut the regional aid for Spain and may have more investments. Well, you know, now you can cut it. It's, <laughs> not, it's not big. Let me the, bring in the Dr. Aid to the eastern Anna? lander is, Look, the, is uh, much the, higher. The, the, the <laughs> private investments. Yeah. There's probably not many countries who do so much private investment as Germany does, for example, in such countries. But of course. No, that's yeah. right. That's right. What, that's what, what, I don't know what, what I'm saying. Say right. 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 Let's right. speak right. about. Right. Nobody so, will say that. Anna, let me bring Dr. Nemiria in. Exactly. <laughs> For the sake of the clarity, why um, Elmar was given uh, Poland and, as a success story, which I agree, but for the sake of the clarity, from the very beginning, Poland and Ukraine, as well as other former Soviet states, were on the different tracks. Yeah. The association and the membership track for Poland and the partnership and cooperation yeah, track absolutely. for Ukraine and others. So that should be a very important uh, uh, point to be taken into account. And Slovakia is one example when initially they were behind, they were uh, catching up. But the issue of the Eurasian Economic Union has to do uh, with, as I understand, on the one hand, a legal issue, issue of compatibility, because uh, Belarus, or Kazakhstan probably will become soon, but Belarus is not a member of the WTO, so the whole issue of the compatibility. But as a matter of, of uh, uh, future, that should not be excluded. Why not? And the one important point I want to make, because sometimes the discussion took an angle like uh, uh, them and us. Yeah. So I think this is a, a counterproductive uh, uh, tone or taste of the discussion. And I want to, uh, it was yesterday, a very good editorial in the Financial Times. It's called, the West must help Ukraine to defend itself. But I think that equally, and even better the title might be for the same article or for the same thoughts, the West must help itself to defend Ukraine. Because defending Ukraine was defending itself. So this is an issue. Because defending, you're not defending territory as such. Not even the citizens who are living. You're defending the, the same space that those countries uh, or citizens aspired for. The rule of law, democracy, human rights, and freedom. Let me bring in Stefan Fuller for a brief comment, and then we're coming back to the audience. Yeah. Good. You know, Putin has advised uh, the Customs Union first and then the Eurasian Union quite smartly. Um, he's advised in, uh, uh, in such a way which does not really allow us to have a bilateral uh, and separate association agreement with its members because there is a lack of, there is a legal incompatibility. You cannot have uh, an agreement uh, with a member of the Customs Union on the trade and on barrier uh, uh, obstacles to the trade uh, or, or not trade obstacles to the uh, uh, trade, if the part of the sovereignty decision in that area is being transferred by the <laughs> member of customs union to Moscow Euro Asian uh, uh, Commission, right? So. Uh, uh, if we give up on the relationship with the Euro Asian Union, we're giving up on the relationship with all these countries, right? That's the first point. The second point. Well, I'm not hiding. Uh, I'm one of those uh, who would agree that uh, the Eurasian Union is a competitive project uh, or competition, I mean, to the European Union. Absolutely. But it does not really change the argument that if that competitive integration project would follow its own regulatory framework, which is not going to be compatible with our regulatory Regime framework, reason. You then really you create in Europe a you dividing line, a new dividing line of trade and economy. Okay. Um, do you have one minute? Because I want to get your response to, to whatever. I agree with Stefan Minister about the Eurasian has, Union. Has Eurasian to say. Union. Um, but, and also the Omar? Chancellor has made this proposal in Davos. Mm -hmm. But it has one condition. The Eurasian Union was partly invented by Moscow to control these countries. And it must be clear that does not Moscow has the right to control the countries. Ukraine wants not to join the Eurasian Union because it does not want it controlled by Eurasian Union by Moscow. 
And this condition must be fulfilled by Moscow before we can have negotiations with the Eurasian Union, the so, freedom and sovereignty of nations. So I understand Mr. Brock may have to leave, but I want to get your comment in, Marshal Sikorsky, in case he wants to respond and then go back to the audience. Well, Poland has been cited as a success story, so let me just remind you how the success of Central Europe, more generally, unfolded. And what happened was that we joined first NATO in 1999. That provided physical security, which was also important for investment. And then we got integrated into the EU. And what we are testing in Ukraine now is whether you can integrate, even just economically, without basic physical security. And I suspect the answer will be negative. Because however well I wish Ukraine to do all these reforms while also fighting a war might be beyond human capacity. I mean, I hope you pull it off. And you, shouldn't, you should, certainly shouldn't use the war as an excuse for not doing reforms. Um, but uh, you ask what the United States can do. Well, here's the answer. Help provide Ukraine some basic <laughs> physical security. So let me bring in this gentleman back here who's been At very patient. At least it has a laundry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Pavel Shudlovsky. I'm chief of mission of Belarus. Thank you very much uh, to Atlantic Council and to the Latvian presidency for inviting our country here. My government uh, authorized me to represent my country and I'm uh, very pleased to listen to discussion, to frank exchange of opinions, heated exchange of opinions. It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. Well, uh, all the dogs are thrown again on Belarus, on human rights, on democracy, on everything. Well. We have human rights problems, we have democracy problems, it, it is not as perfect as it can be. We are doing the best we can to ex improve our human rights situation. We are doing that. But in this situation, what is important is that our very sovereignty, independence is at stake. And in this situation, our country has to be embraced into engagement with Russia, with the European Union. We are, we are there in this geopolitical context. So what I ask and suggest all speakers, and maybe you can have a comment on that, is that maybe it is time to recognize the special place of Belarus, the role of Belarus in this particular moment, in this particular place, to extend a helping hand to Belarus in our economic situation, which is tied to Russian economic problem. Engage Belarus, respect its sovereignty, which was said and which we really appreciate, and start cooperation with us through engagement. Right. So and we value our possibility to engage in Eastern Partnership. We have proposed a number of proposals to Eastern okay. Partnership, and we right. want to engage more. Let's, okay, so uh, and go the ahead. The more you deliver on fundamental freedoms and human rights, the more we will help you. You know, uh, can I? Let's can talk I about. That, can no, I? No. no, can I make that uh, that that point? When I was listening, I mean, actually, debate uh, debate in in the morning, and I had a occasionally a, a feeling that in the light of this tremendous challenge in you, we start to missing again, again, an important point. Now, if you ask me what I think was sort of big, biggest achievement of the neighborhood policy as defined 2011, I would, I would tell you this one. We combine the values and interest together as the angle of our uh, external policies, okay? Let's not make that a victim of the real politics again, okay? The fundamental freedoms, human rights, the civil society, democracy needs to stay in the main focus of what we are doing. Once we slide back in the direction of only real politics, it's a slide uh, I don't want to participate in. Let me bring in the Moldovan ambassador. And then we'll Thank you very much. A uh, stone was thrown in my garden, and I have to respond. <laughs> well, uh, probably 
Mr. Elman Brock, you should not conclude or make conclusions and the, and the declarations or statements of politicians because sometimes politicians have to adapt or confront with the challenges. At this point when Moldova is after elections still forming the government, it is no any clarity about the risk because the strategical aim for Moldova is to be fully integrated with the European Union and uh, implement all the obligations deriving from the association agreement and the CFTA and, and visa free, etc. So uh, this is the anchor that we are very seriously considering uh, with, uh, and without any kind of uh, reference to the color of the government. We have a framework. And uh, what we need, we need to advance this framework. Otherwise, you will look at Moldova and you will uh, li be like the car driver driving in Washington according to the sky, not to the GPS. And what is extremely important also for now is to understand that um, European Union has also leadership. And the European Union uh, is also aware, aware about the, uh, the political parties that demand divisions inside of the uh, European Union. From the arrows that have been thrown between you and uh, Minister Palacio, it seems that you will not vote for Spain for the EU membership. Because there are, there are difference, differences in your view. What we need in Eastern Europe, we need a, a strong support from your side, and we need a, to be part of the strategy. Understand. In the European Union, we debate a lot, but in the end, we just we come we come to a we muddle through, but we agree. So I want to bring in Dr. Nemiria. <laughs> yes, yeah. this is true, actually, Dr. Nemiria. Well, first, I want just to clarify with the Belarusian yes. official. Uh, you said uh, uh, there is a threat to your sovereignty. Who is threatening uh, your sovereignty? May I yes, you may answer that briefly. Lithuania. Thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in the current circumstances, when the war is going, as our president said, just next door to Belarus, mm. and the arms race is virtually happening in the western borders of Belarus, we feel that our, t our yeah. independence and territorial integrity is threatened. So we are between, you know, between the fire and the frying pan, between... Is it, is it threatened by the instability or instability, is it threatened by a particular country? Not a particular country. I won't <laughs> say about a particular country. I won't say names, but you know, instability, unpredictability, arms race in our Western borders. We need to understand what is happening. We need to understand that this is not intended against us and our... Country is not like a play card in this geopolitical right. game when we can lose independence no, in the moment. Yeah. That's why we changed our martial law it, just a few days ago. It, hap it ac enters into force on the 1st of February, uh, and it gives special provisions which trigger the imposition of martial law in the country. So, all right, thank you. We have a bunch of other questions here. Uh, let me get... Her right there, and then back there, and then we're going to have a final round. I think. A quick question. Uh, my name is Nino Jepetiza. I have a question addressed to Elmar. Um, rhetoric is so important. I imagine if Putin were to listen to our conversation here, what you said about in five years, not a single country would be ready to join the European <laughs> Union, is music to his ears. Um, why are we creating this music rather than helping countries that are so much making strides to be ready? to join European Union. Why not focus on the positive and make five years something for us to celebrate rather than say that not a single country would be ready? Thank okay. you. And in like three rows back, the gentleman, put your hand up. Yes, thank you. Let me add another Georgian voice. So I'm a Gegam Galublishvili, former Georgian ambassador to NATO. So if I combine some a very short comment, if I combine somehow a couple of messages that I got here is that uh, Ukraine is not going to get any defense capabilities, not to escalate uh, uh, farther the situation from the Russian side. And unless we fully reform, we are not going to get a, a European perspective. And uh, I'm coming from domestic politics as well. I was a Georgian prime minister during the, after the uh, Georgian-Russian war. So uh, there are uh, some uh, 
groups, political groups uh, in all of those countries who are seriously committed to reform and make a very diff difficult reforms. Uh, and if those countries do not have a very clear picture, uh, where is the end state? And if those countries are uh, cons uh, consistently told that, well, you are not going to get a membership action plan, but we will give you some kind of another commitment. It's not a European perspective. You first to deliver those things. I think that at the end of the day, with those two messages, you will weaken those uh, uh, people in those countries who are committed to reforms. Surprisingly, Russia has become very successful in using a soft power, and you will uh, eventually see all of those countries backsliding, going back happily to the uh, Russian-dominated whatever organization it's called. So this is a sure recipe of going back. If we don't want to go back, I need that we need a, those kind of a leaders, courageous leaders, that develop the idea of Europe whole, free, and at peace. And that's why Poland get in, that's why Czech Republic get in, and that's why Hungary get in, because uh, there was that kind of a strong idea, which unfortunately vanished. Thank you. So I would like Elmar Brock to respond to that. I mean, in terms of these two questions about is the EU or is the rhetoric undercutting the reform efforts of these countries that are trying to move forward. And how can we avoid that? If you can't give them a membership perspective, what are other ways that the we can incentivize The best on Balkan countries them? have a membership perspective since Thessaloniki 2003, if I remember that. Mm -hmm. If I see the internal development of Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina, then we cannot take them in. We cannot even start membership right. negotiations. To give you a few examples, there's also an answer uh, to that question. With Serbia, I have at the moment a positive feeling that we come forward. But technically, it's not possible to do that in five years, even if it goes no. positively forward. And uh, therefore, the Serbia has, is in a very difficult situation. They say, and the Prime Minister says, my, my, my uh, head tells me that Brussels is the future. Europe is the only future for the country, but their cultural relationship will play a role in that country. Old religious questions and so on, the Pan-Slavic uh, question historically uh, play a role. That a real fight within the country, in, within pe individual people, uh, to find a solution there. And here we have to be helpful in such negotiations. And uh, therefore, I believe that the present Serbian government has a positive attitude despite all the problems in that question with sanctions on Ukraine and Russia and all that. And I think we should be supportive for them that they can make it. And I think in the Western Balkans is to include Serbia on the utmost importance because that is a decision of stability for the whole Western Balkans, if Serbia could be a part of that, and we support that. The Germany supports it, the European Union supports it, and uh, we will do so, and that is the question. Not a music for Europe, uh, what you say, for, for Putin. What we have to do, the European Union is a political entity. We cannot solve the problem of this world if the countries do not want to come in, fulfill the conditions. We are a state-like organization with values, not just an economic area. And therefore, these countries have to fulfill that. Also, if they do not fill the market economy conditions, they will be pushed down if the conditions is not fulfilled for that. And therefore, negotiation needs that time, and they need it always time. And when it was said that it was not even for support for Spain, I belong to the parliament committee for the negotiations for the membership of Spain. And I have a short, uh, long memory in that, <laughs> that I said certain good things in that time in the 80s, as, as Germany did at that time for Spain, as for Poland. We played, uh, I think, in both cases, a quite uh, pushy role in favor uh, to get this member, uh, these countries in the, in, into the European Union. And uh, I think, oh, personally, I have made a criticism here because of the uh, debate in Washington, D.C., uh, but I have my personal record, I think, which is enlargement, not so bad, because I was the main uh, rapporteur of the European Parliament of the membership of the 12 countries at that time and was pushing for that. So nobody can blame me for that. But if you could talk, come to Moldova, I took part last week, four hours, in the coalition negotiations in Moldova. And uh, I know something about that. If you have a problem that some people do not like to have an independent uh, 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 what is General Shazal, General Shazal, uh, General Prosecutor, because he might be too strong to fight corruption. But he's a main obstacle to come with the Liberal parties to term, 
then I become nervous. The readiness to fight corruption is a condition. Yeah. It's a condition. And this is one of the reasons why they do not like to have a liberal party in that. Right. And uh, so I can continue and, 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 and these things have to be seen to be practical to come to proper solutions. And um, I'm in favor of the membership, uh, not a membership, uh, the membership, the question of helping non Belarusia. But as uh, Stefan rightly said, uh, please let a few uh, human rights defenders out of prison. Yeah. Makes also life for us easier. Right. <laughs> so, and I think we can all agree that actually enlargement has been one of the great success stories of the EU others. over the last yeah. two <laughs> decades. But I want to have a final set with you all here of brief, questions, brief answers, and you can uh, pick up a couple of things that you might have not yet had a chance to respond to. But I want to take this back to the question of US engagement. Because I think that uh, Radek Sikorsky has put an interesting uh, point on the table, which is that the US, in a way, is responsible, that's too strong a word, but is, is the mechanism or the country which can provide security. And we are right now embarked on an experiment contrary to some of the earlier experiences of trying to provide integration before that security was there. So one way of interpreting this, if you're an American, and interpreting the, the comments here from the panel, is that the United States should help in providing security, but we should not tell Europe what to do when it comes to integration, because that's an intra-European issue. And I'm not entirely sure that that is fair or reasonable, um, but I'm looking for things, ways that we can engage this process, this very important process, which I think is key to the future stability and freedom of Europe and not just of the eastern part of Europe. And so I think that you have here an audience that would love to hear a bit more about what, what can the US do to help make, in the first instance, Riga, or the road to Riga successful, but also as we look forward in the Eastern Partnership, what can we contribute to this effort? So let me start, we'll go this, this way. Make it easy for you, hopefully. <laughs> Never ever leave Europe again, okay? Uh, and I'm referring uh, to the uh, reset policy being accompanied reset. by the US uh, withdrawing from the Eastern Europe. Never ever do that again, please. Second, uh, uh, let's not peep each other uh, uh, from the business, okay? Uh, we have each other sort of uh, uh, a, a very special uh, instrument and offers uh, to put on the table. We strong when we reinforce each other. Uh, we weak when we start accusing each other that we're making uh, a mistake. Number three, uh, let's uh, talk uh, to each other, not through the uh, op-eds uh, and articles in New York Times uh, uh, or some other uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, uh, I'm still sort of looking for a, a structured dialogue uh, uh, to address uh, these issues between the uh, US uh, and the European Union. And number four, let's take up seriously the European, uh, European security, okay? Uh, it needs to be reshaped, uh, it needs to be reshaped uh, with you uh, uh, having an important uh, role, uh, uh, let's see where to start uh, uh, and let's uh, see uh, how we could uh, uh, reshape and, 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 and change that trend uh, which is extremely dangerous at this point of the time. Anna, that's you. Well, I fully agree with what has been said and I will only underline uh, one issue is that we we really are confronted a different world. And we are confronted a different world that is about our values, this idea of a liberal rule of law based international order. And there we have to be very clear what is at stake and not be distracted by other issues that although important are not crucial. I would like to add something about the Georgia, uh, you say that in five years, and I mentioned the case of Spain and Elmar brought Spain, when we started negotiation, we were 70% of the GDP per capita of the then rich communities. We didn't have to change one secondary law, 
we didn't have to change any instruction, but of course we needed to have the, the, the uh, I mean, the, the political rights and the constitution. So the change in Spain, we have laws, uh, so in order to adapt to the European Union, we didn't have to, to change anything, to have the constitution and political rights. And it took us 10 years. Once more, the, there is a mirage that the, the reference is the fifth enlargement, the enlargement to Poland. This was an enlargement that in some cases was rushed. And we are, we are, right, we are suffering the consequences of this rush enlargement. This will never happen again. There will be, in my opinion, there should be a European perspective, but a European perspective to join when a country fulfills the Copenhagen criteria. And as I say, 70% of the GDP per capita we are very, I mean, we, we are very grateful of all the funds that uh, Spain has benefited as other, for instance, the Eastern Lender or for instance, Poland. This has been a fantastic policy. But do not think of the 10 the, the countries enlargement as a reference. Uh, uh, for the United States, I think the important is uh, not just to be together, but complementary to each other uh, with the European Union. There are some things that the EU is better equipped to do that should be the case. There are some things that the US better equipped to do and has more political will to do. So that should be the ideal scenario. The second thing which is uh, important uh, as far as the current crisis is concerned, it is important and I have a sense that in the US it's now better understood uh, to be more creative uh, thinking about the conventional elements of the hybrid war, which has to do a military component, not as a substitution, not as the uh, main instrument for solution, but a component uh, for solution. Without it, it would not be possible. Second thing, bring attention, better attention to the importance of the external border, international border of Ukraine, <coughs> monitoring and very important, uh, credible verification of this border. So far, it is insufficient. And third thing, it is two areas. There are two areas in Ukraine that are important and probably the, 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 uh, where the, the point of departure for its economic revival, energy and agriculture. I think there is a plenty of opportunities for private investments. Uh, and it is important also, that's why I support Elmer's point, so the better and the sooner uh, Ukraine will deliver, and I see some momentum on the judicial reform, the prosecutor's office reform, the rule of law as such, then that potential will be uh, utilized. But energy and agriculture, I think, stands as a very important areas. Thank you. Very briefly, Elmer. I can just repeat one sentence. Great. I was yesterday in a meeting with the vice president. He had four points in his introduction remarks. The second point was the European Union has to be united and nobody should have a chance to divide the European Union in these circumstances with the Eastern Partnership. And I think that is a good contribution by the United States that it helps us to achieve that. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the panel for such an interesting and lively discussion. Um, and I also want to uh, let, we should all give them a hand. Um, and I want to invite Ambassador Juris Plikhans, the uh, Latvian envoy for the Riga summit, to say a few words. Dear friends, and dear friends more specifically in the Atlantic Council, uh, when we had initial deliberations on the content of this event last September here in the same building of the Atlantic Council, I can conclude that we have had very interesting and very ideas provo provoking event. After so many interventions, it's difficult to add anything new, but let me offer some general remarks and then more specifically about what we can expect from Riga Summit. It's absolutely clear that the Eastern Partnership Policy is a policy of the European Union and it will remain a policy of the European Union and primary responsibility over this region on tackling the crisis in this region lies within the European Union. And I agree here with the Moldovan ambassador, this is about European leadership in this region. If we want to tackle the crisis in our neighborhood and we are unable to tackle the crisis, then the question is where we can do it. The second, I agree completely also with Mr. Nemiria, who was saying we must search for complementarity of our efforts in the area of the Eastern Partnership, not only with the United States but with other likely-minded countries, be it Canada, be it Japan, be it South Korea, because we share the same vision of stability and prosperity in this part of the world. I think the Eastern Partnership has neither succeeded nor it has failed, 
because we have not been able to create the ring of stability and prosperity around all our borders, but at the same time, we have the necessary instruments in place. We have three association agreements signed with Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, which are important political documents, and if properly implemented, it can be a game changer in this part of the world. And, but at the same time, it's absolutely clear that these countries will need our assistance, the assistance of the European Union, in implementing this agreement. And the, implement the quality of the implementation of these association agreements can bring tangible changes on the ground. Because when we again refer to Moldova, we saw the latest parliamentary elections, where the nation is still very much divided. I agree with Minister Leitschach, who said this morning, we don't need to invent anything new when it comes to the European neighborhood policy. We must stick to our principles, to our commitments, and our initial plans. There is nothing wrong in the European neighborhood policy, and more specifically in the Eastern Partnership, in our willingness to have stability and prosperity. And more specifically about Riga summit, it has been mentioned here several times already today. The summit will take place in a difficult environment, and the summit itself is a very important part of the Eastern Partnership policy. This is a process. We don't know what is the end road. It has been discussed today many times, but the summit itself presents an opportunity and occasion to demonstrate the importance of the Eastern Partnership for European policymakers, for Eastern Partnership policymakers, for elites and societies of these states. We shouldn't be critical of what has been achieved during the last five years, and more specifically, looking from Vilnius to Riga, I mentioned here about three association agreements. We have a visa-free regime introduced to the Republic of Moldova. I hope we come close towards at least a decision of introducing a visa-free with Georgia and Ukraine, and we are making the first steps when it comes to visa facilitation with Belarus. So even within this year and a half, we have achieved quite a lot. And I, I can just conclude that the Latvian presidency will continue working on the success of Riga summit. We see this as a summit of inclusiveness. All six Eastern partners are important for Latvia, be it also those countries, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Belarus, because here, like former Commissioner Fiola mentioned, we are not building new dividing lines within the Eastern partnership. We are not building new dividing lines between Europe and Russia, but what we are searching, we are searching stability and prosperity in these countries. Thank you very much once more for being patient today and to the Atlantic Council for their efforts to make this event a success. Thank, Thank you. you. Is this on? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, your Ambassador Porkins. I just want to, uh, I won't prolong us. I just want to thank everyone who's joined us throughout the proceedings today, particularly thank our speakers who have done just a phenomenal job. Um, we set out this morning to try to tackle a few key questions. How do we actually that deters Putin's aggression in Ukraine and potentially elsewhere? How do we begin to formulate our own vision for what we want in Europe's east, our own values and interests in the region? How do we avoid a gray zone of instability in the region? And can we restore the prospect, a credible prospect of a Europe whole and free that includes uh, this region? What we're taking away from this, we've heard a call for more decisive, determined strategy, a response to what's unfolding in Ukraine today embedded in a broader strategic response. And I think we've taken our homework. We're going to be working among the team here in the Atlantic Council to extract, uh, borrow, steal many of the ideas that have come across the stage today uh, to help to begin to articulate what that strategy looks like. So we'll be coming back to tap many of you to remain involved in this process. And I think one of the key things that I'm taking away from this is that we shouldn't be focused on how little we can do reluctantly or what our politics will be able to accept for the short term, um, but how much can we do? What can we do to restore and advance our values and interest in this space? Um, so I just want to offer a final word of thanks. There's been a terrific team that's been part of helping to put this together. One of the ministers here said, you have this brilliant group of young people that just run around and get everything done. That's really true. Many of them are in this room, Simona, Megan, Kate, uh, and many who are not in this room as well, uh, from Sarah uh, to Vicente, Paul, Maureen, Ju Julie, our whole team just has done a fantastic job. 
uh, and I want to thank my partner in this effort, uh, Fran Burwell, as well as Ambassador John Herbst, who's helped, been helping uh, steward this entire uh, effort, and our, our group of supporters that really made this possible, uh, working with uh, Michael Saakiv and Paul Grodd at the U uh, Ukrainian World Congress, uh, with Steve, Stif uh, Steve from Frontera Resources, thank you for being here, and finally, most of all, to uh, yours, Ambassador Poikens, uh, it's the Latvian Foreign Ministry and the Latvian Embassy that really approached us first uh, and raised the prospect of what we might be able to do on the path to the Riga summit. We thank you for the opportunity to have built this platform, to have built this debate, uh, and we're not going to let it go from today. We're going to continue on the, uh, not only on the path to Riga, uh, but for many years ahead of this. So thank you very much, and thank you for giving us your day.